Popular Mechanics Magazine, Volume 99, January 1953, Number 1. In this issue, for the Craftsman, SS United States, Part 2. With the model of the SS United States completed to the point discussed in Part 1, which took the model maker through the carving of the hull, we are ready to add the four propeller housing. The stern profile drawing below is presented one half actual size to assist you in plotting the location of each housing on your hull. Both fore and aft housings are made in pairs, each carved alike, except for being shaped left and right hand. Each housing, you will notice, resembles a tapered three-sided wedge and is individually shaped to fit the hull. The hub is formed on the aft end of each housing to take a standard four-blade propeller, approximately one-half inch in diameter. The cross-section size at the aft end of the housing measures approximately three-eighths by one-half inch. After the housings are shaped to your liking, they are glued to the sides of the hull, each being placed in relation to station lines H and G. To make the housings look like integral parts of the hull, Fillets of wood putty are neatly formed along the joints and later sanded smooth. The pattern for the rudder is given full size, ready for tracing on a piece of stiff cardboard or hardwood. After it is cut and glued in place, the rudder is made to look like it actually pivots by scoring the joint slightly with a point of a knife. With the hull set aside for the moment, we can turn our attention to laying out the various decks that make up the superstructure of the ship. Here you referred back to part one and the patterns which were given for the wood and metal decks. You will recall these patterns are half size and are shown on one half inch squares to permit you to enlarge them to full size. Actual size patterns for these parts have been prepared for those not wishing to enlarge the magazine patterns. Not counting the stacks, some 18 separate pieces are required for the superstructure. The long promenade deck is cut from a piece of soft pine, measuring 3 8 inch thick. The fore end of this deck is undercut 1 8 inch to set over the shear step near station line C, C. The metal promenade deck aft is placed on top of the wooden upper deck, which is butted against the shear step between station lines G and F. If desired, the metal decks can be made of fiberboard, gluing rather than soldering the bulwark, the bulwarks to them. If metal is used, brass or any sheet metal will do as it is later painted. The long wooden sun deck tops the promenade deck. Note that the fore end of this deck is cut down to bring the metal sports deck flush with the surface. The sun deck and the raised promenade deck which are placed on top of the metal promenade deck are one piece. Notice that the sun deck is cut from 132 inch thick cardboard or metal and overhangs the deck along each side. The four sports deck, like the large sun deck, is cut down to 132 inch to permit the metal navigation bridge to set flush. The aft sports deck carries the aft stack deck house and both the aft and four stack deck houses are cut from single blocks with step cuts where indicated to take on the stacks themselves. Patterns for the two deck houses located on the foredeck are given full size and general assembly drawings on page 183. In addition to these, two raised hatches are required, one measuring 1 8 by 3 quarters by 1 inch and the other 1 8 by 9 16 by 7 8 inch. Two flush hatches on the aft on the plan view part one are merely drawn on the deck surfaces. The pull apart assembly drawings of the decks will give a general idea of their relation, but the plan view is used when permanently locating them on the hull. Later in a series of articles, you will be told on each how on each deck is finished individually. Start from the lower one, the promenade deck, and work your way up. Both of the sleek, raked stacks are alike, except the aft one is somewhat smaller. Patterns for their teardrop shapes are drawn full size in the square drawing and traced on a soft pine block. Top and bottom, 
A stepped cut on the bottom of each stack allows them to fit over the edges of the deck houses. The tops of the stacks are rounded all around, and a recess is cut in the top of each one. Smoke deflector fins designed to deflect exhaust from upper decks are added to each stack at the top. These can be thin cardboard inserted in saw cuts made with a hacksaw blade or merely cut out to fit the contour of the stacks and glued into position. Whistles, antennas, brackets, towers, and other stack fittings are added later. Of general interest, the construction of the actual SS United States is the fact that the stacks were riveted together with a total of 65,000 aluminum rivets. These were the first tempered rivets, heating them, then storing them in freezer chests, and finally driving them in ice cold, a new departure in riveting. The Mammoth twin stacks stand as high as a four-story house. The spread and width of ten parked automobiles. Traveling cranes hoisted them aloft in the two sections and set them onto the hull while the ship was being built in dry dock. So much for the superstructure for the present. The SS United States is equipped with three anchors, one in a leading edge of the bow and one on each side of the hull, the station line AA. On the model, the side anchors are housed in shallow recesses, chiseled in the hull. The size and location of the recesses are taken off the profile view. The measurements are being dub doubled, of course, since the drawing is one half full size. The anchors can be purchased from a model supply house, and in mounting them, holes are drilled in the hull for the shanks and the ladder cemented in place. Bolster plates at the lower edges with the side anchor recesses are cut to shape from thin cardboard and glued to the hull. The hull now can be painted. If you are satisfied with the final sanding, give the hull four coats of sanding sealer to build up a smooth base for the paint. Let each coat dry and sand with a 4-0 paper. As the water line established, the line where the bottom paint ends, mask off the rest of the hull with tape and newspaper. If a spray gun is available, lay on several coats of red lacquer, rubbing each one lightly, when dry with a 4.0 waterproof paper. If the painting is done with a brush, use a quality 4-hour enamel. Final painting of the hull above the waterline is left until the portholes are installed. Placing some 775 portholes on both sides of the hull is a tedious job. They add tremendously to the detail of the model. In studying the outboard profile view in part one, you'll note that the portholes are installed in four rows, which run parallel with the shear line. The spacing of the rows as well as the portholes is done best with a pair of dividers. Doubling the spacing for each one is given in the half size profile view, and then transferring it directly to the hull. The portholes are tiny eyelets about 1 16th inch in diameter, which can be purchased. A hole is drilled slightly undersized for each eyelet, after which it is tapped in place with a small pin punch. The spacing of the portholes is the same on both sides of the hull. Landing ports in the side of the hull are indicated with white lines scratched in the black paint. Continued next month.